mark and priority, is perhaps the most important insight of modern New Testament scholarship into the interpretation of the Gospels. Mark and priority is thankfully one of the least controversial propositions in New Testament scholarship. You will struggle long and hard to find anyone who is currently publishing peer-reviewed scholarship on the synoptic problem who disagrees with Mark and priority. Mark and priority is the position that Matthew and Luke are literarily dependent on the Gospel of Mark. That is, when the authors of Matthew and Luke went to compose their gospel, they copied out of Mark. Mark and priority is part of the synoptic problem. That's not a problem in the terms of an objection, but a puzzle, a pattern of evidence that there are multiple ways to explain and there are competing explanations. Mark and priority is the least controversial part of the synoptic problem. We'll talk about the more controversial part later. The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not John. John is the fourth gospel in the New Testament canon. And, and to say John is not synoptic is not to say it's not canonical. It's not to say anything about historicity. All it is is to say that the way that Mar Mark, Matthew, and Luke relate to each other is different than the way that John relates to any one of the three. John has no parables no exorcisms, no pithy aphoristic sayings so familiar to us from the synoptics. Mark, Matthew, and Luke, on the other hand, tell most of the same stories, and they tell those stories in almost the exact same words. There are 661 verses in the Gospel of Mark. 600 of these appear verbatim in Matthew. That is, Matthew has copied over sometimes 30 word strings um, of Mark into the gospel. Um, well, that will be the claim of Mark and priority. Uh, but whatever your position, it is true that Mark and Matthew, that 90% of Mark appears word for word in Matthew. S the same is true of Luke, although on a slightly smaller scale, but a little over half of the gospel of Mark shows up verbatim in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, there is a large chunk of Mark, what's called the Great Omission, that includes parts of chapters 6, 7, and 8, uh, that is excluded from Luke. Scholars debate why, we won't get into that today. Um, but in the same way, uh, huge portions of Mark, over half of Mark, shows up verbatim in Luke. So, let's, I won't ask you to take my word for it. Let's look at some examples in a second. But the claim of Mark and priority will be that Mark has been copied over into Matthew and Luke. And I will be using these colors throughout this slide to designate words that are unique to Mark, words that are unique to Matthew, and words that are unique to Luke. That is, things that are Markan will be blue, and so on. If things are both in Mark and Matthew, they will be purple. Blue and uh, yellow make green, and red and yellow make orange. So, what is the traditional position on authorship? Well, this goes back to Poppius. Um, the traditional position is that Matthew was a disciple of Jesus and wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Luke was a hearer of Paul. Mark was a follower of Peter, who recorded Peter's sayings. And John was written by the beloved disciple John. We won't be talking about John today, but the other three, it needs to be said first of all, that is that the attribution to Matthew, Luke, and Mark is not in the Gospels. Nowhere in any of these three Gospels does Matthew say, I, Matthew, am writing this. Uh, the same goes for Mark or Luke. So they are anonymous internally. They do, in the manuscripts that come down to us, have titles on them. So this is photograph here, um, directly below me, is Codex Vaticanus, one of our earliest and most important complete New Testaments. Uh, and you see there, Cata Matthion, according to Matthew. Now, something needs to be said right away about this title formula, because Cata, according to, is not a traditional way of designating an author. When Lucian writes, 
When people refer to the works of Lucian or Plutarch or any other historian, Josephus perhaps, they don't say the antiquities of the Jews according to Josephus. They say by Josephus. They've got a good, perfectly good Greek word for that. Kata isn't that. Kata is a word that you use to distinguish multiple versions of something. That is, kata is, um, this refers to this person's version of a thing. And you only use that word when there are multiple such things, right? Um, and so the use of the title kata, scholars are, even scholars who believe Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew would agree that this is a later designation. This is something that's been attached to the Gospels later. And there are good reasons, when you look at second century literature, to believe that the Gospels were known just as, the, under the title, the Gospel, um, well into the second century. So at a certain point, when enough of these things show up and people have them in their libraries, they need a way to distinguish them from each other, and they add the word kata Matthew, kata Luke. Um, which means there's nothing in the synoptics that claims any sort of apostolic or sub-apostolic, in the case of Luke and Mark, authorship. Um, it's a claim that's completely imposed from the outside. So I need to shrink myself here real quick. Uh, the earliest tradition and the source of all subsequent traditions is Papias of Hierapolis. He lives at the beginning of the second century, and he gives us the and he provides the source for belief in that Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark and Matthew wrote Matthew. He's the earliest witness to this. Um, it's worth noting that even Papias doesn't actually survive. This is only derived from a quotation of Papias in Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History. So he says, Mark, having become an interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. And Matthew, skipping down, put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them as best he could. So here we have Mark Gospels attributed to Mark and Matthew. But as historians, we have to ask ourselves, is Papias a reliable witness? Can we trust Papias? Take Papias' word for it. Well, there's some good reasons to think not. There's good reasons to question whether or not Papias is himself acting as an interpreter of the Gospels and doesn't, in fact, have um, first-hand knowledge or some sort of traditional knowledge about the disciples of Jesus. Um, so one of the good reasons to think this, to begin with, is his, the confusion of Philip's. There's another tradition attributed to Papias where he speaks of the apostle Philip's daughters who live in Hierapolis. And the issue with this is Papias seems to have conflated to Philip's. There is a Philip, the disciple of Jesus, known to us from the Gospels, and there's a Philip from Acts, who is a Greek who has daughters. And it seems, there's good reason to think here, that referring to an apostle Philip who has daughters is a conflation of the disciple of Jesus with the figure from Acts. And this suggests that Papias is not a, reci a recipient of first-hand knowledge about the inner circle of Jesus, but rather is looking at texts the same way we do today and drawing inferences from these texts. Um, that he has con he confused these two figures in a way that someone who knew them wouldn't have, but in a way that an interpreter of scripture would. Another big problem with Papias' testimony is he says Matthew was composed in Hebrew. Now, all of our copies of Matthew are in Greek, and there's very good reason to think Matthew was composed in Greek. I will provide some of that later when we look at the text of Matthew compared to the text of Mark. Um, but this, but Papias himself seems to know, already at the beginning of the second century, he doesn't seem to have access to any sort of Hebrew Matthew. Uh, he, notice he says, each one interpreted them as best he could. This is the same word commonly used for translate. I think this is good testimony that Papias himself doesn't have any first-hand knowledge of uh, the composition of Matthew. He knows that Matthew is a disciple of Jesus and believes it has a text that has been traditionally assigned to Matthew, and so says, well, it must have been composed in Hebrew, and the Greek copies we have lying around, because that's all he knows of, um, were interpreted variously, and this is, you know, this is, the, this is the text he's familiar with. So here again, we have Papias telling us something about the Gospels that there's good reason to think isn't correct. Now, that doesn't mean Papias is wrong, of course. It doesn't follow from this that Matthew didn't write Matthew. 
what follows from this is that we probably shouldn't take Papias at his word. Um, that is, it's not, Papias shouldn't be dispositive. Papias may in fact be right. Um, Papias may record a good tradition about Mark being a hero of Peter. Um, in fact, nothing I say today will at all conflict with the idea that Mark was a hero of Peter. Um, it won't bear in either direction, in fact. Um, but what it does mean is that we probably need to question whether, uh, we, need, we need to look for other sources of evidence about the origin of the Gospels. And we don't really have anywhere else to look but to the Gospels themselves. So let's begin by establishing there is a literary relationship between the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Back in 2016, a certain Melania Trump gave a speech where she uh, extolled the virtues of hard work and the willingness to work um, and dreaming big. And commentators quickly pointed out that four years earlier, another inaugural first lady had done the exact same thing had, and had used the exact same words. You can see highlighted in yellow the verbatim agreement and where there are differences they are synonymous glosses. There's a com most people are pretty well convinced that this was a case of plagiarism committed by some minor staffer who surely had been uh, listening to recent uh, inaugural speeches. So, we have the same thing, but even more extreme, going on in the Synoptic Gospels. Here, in the story traditionally called the Johanna and Thunderbolt, we have, um, we have significant verbatim agreement. 29 words in Greek. If you get out your Greek synopsis and compare these things, uh, there are 29 words verbatim agreement between Matthew and Luke here. The differences are tiny differences of tense that have to be translated with helping verbs. Um, or, uh, I guess in this case, the word is is a difference. Um, similarly, in uh, the story of the faithful slave, not my favorite story from the Synoptic Gospels, we find, we find significant verbatim agreement. As many as 28 words. And there are more extreme cases. There are stories in Luke. Um, there's a 50-word long story in Luke where 40 of the words are copied verbatim out of Mark. If I asked each of you today, if we all watched a TV show, and I asked each of you to describe it to me, how much, um, independently, to write down independent records of that TV show, how much of that, how much verbatim agreement would there be between your accounts? Maybe a little bit. You know, maybe if there was a really notable, interesting saying, uh, three, the, three of, the three different people would have the same phrase. But 29 words, 28 words, 30 words, 40 words out of a block of 50, that seems um, very unlikely. 28 continuous words. And it's even more unlikely in the, in the Greek language. Because Greek, in Greek, word order doesn't really matter. Or it doesn't matter the same way it does in English. You can write the sentence, Ian dog bites, those three words, and put those words in any order, and you change the spelling of the word to indicate who is biting whom. But it means you can write the sentence, bites, Ian, dog, dog, Ian, bites, um, in any order. And one of the striking things about the synoptics is they agree not only in their choice of words to describe things, but in the order in which they put those words. But it gets even more complicated. Because on this hypothetical scenario, you weren't watching a TV show in English. You were describing it in English, but the TV show was recorded in Spanish. And you have to write me a description in English. The scenario is analogous because, of course, Jesus didn't speak Greek. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. The most famous thing Jesus is recorded to have said in Aramaic from the Gospels is Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark translates it this way, a perfectly good translation. My God, my God, on account of what have you forsaken me? Matthew translates it this way. These are both good translations, but they have these two words verbatim in common. 
all the rest has been changed. Now, the point of this is not that Mark and Matthew are particularly close here. They're not. The point is that you can translate Aramaic, as with any language, you can translate it in multiple ways very well. There are perfectly good ways to translate it. And Mark, Matthew, and Luke, it seems, have translated the teaching of Jesus into Greek exactly the same way, with the exact same words in the exact same order. But it's not just the teaching of Jesus, of course. There's also descriptions of the scenario, of the environment. So on our TV show example, I'm asking you to not only describe to me the show, but the weather, what the weather was like on the day you watched it. And um, maybe the commercials as well. Things around it, the setting around it. Um, and we see that going on in the synoptics. If you're still not convinced, there's verbatim agreement in authorial comments, in authorial interjections. So in the synoptic apocalypse, when Jesus is talking about the end of the world, Matthew and Luke, Mark both have an interjection where the author says, let the reader understand. He's calling attention to something that is particularly important. And they both copied over in the exact same place amidst an extended verbatim agreement. So uh, I guess if we were just to carry on the analogy, it would be like two different people independently saying that this was their favorite part of the TV show in the exact same words. So, where does that leave us? Well, that gives that establishes for us a that establishes for us that there is in fact verbatim the literary relationship, and there are lots of different ways we could construct this. This isn't all of them, of course. This is just one particular set of arrangements that are all possible, right, on literary on a literary relationship between the synoptic gospels. Can we narrow down the options? I'm going to have to shrink myself here. Well, yes, we can. There's a pattern of evidence that helps us narrow it down to these two options. This is Mark as the middle term. In most stories, most often in the Gospels, Mark is the middle term. Uh, another word for this would be common denominator. That is, it, when, when all three Gospels tell a story, M Matthew and Luke usually don't agree with each other except where they agree with the Gospel of Mark. So here's a case study of that. Um, brown is where all three agree identical. So we have huge chunks of brown. Um, uh, notice there's green, which is Math Mark and Luke only agreeing. There's uh, a little bit of purple, which is just Mark and Matthew agreeing. Um, but look how little orange there is. And this is a common pattern in the Gospels. There's almost, we'll look at some major exceptions in when we talk uh, in the next lecture about um, solutions to what's called the double tradition. Uh, but um, in lots and lots of stories, um, there's almost no orange. There's almost no places where Matthew and Luke agree with each other where they don't also agree with Mark. In this case, it's the verb elthen, the most, one of the most common verbs in the Gospels. He came, or come. Um, it's a form of the verb come, which, and a, uh, the provision of an if in a, other, in a conditional clause that kind of wants it anyways. Mark is here as being kind of uh, pithy, being kind of concise. Um, and Matthew and Luke, it is totally plausible that Matthew and Luke have independently added um, one of the most common verbs of going in the Gospels and the word if in a sentence that kind of needs an if anyways. Um, so here we see that math Mark is the common denominator, is the middle term for Matthew, Luke, and Mark. So uh, I need to say just really on a side point that this doesn't technically exclude this uh, third option, but there are very good reasons to exclude it. And you're going to have to just trust me on that for today. That's the one thing I'll ask you to trust me. Um, so we've got it down to these two options, right? Can we narrow it further? Well, let's try to do these two parts separately. Can Mark, can we show that Mark is dependent, that Matthew is dependent on Mark? Can we establish a direction of dependence for Mark and Matthew? And can we establish a direction of dependence for Mark and Luke? This is Mark S. Goodacre of Duke University. He proposed an argument that I think is awesome. 
that is, the argument from editorial fatigue, specifically unidirectional editorial fatigue. Editorial fatigue is when an author copying from a source makes a characteristic change to that source, that is the kind of change they can be seen to be making elsewhere, they make a characteristic change to their source, and then lapse back into the wording of their source, creating thereby a narrative inconsistency. So let's look at that concretely. We have the Gospel of Mark, yes, writing the Gospel, uh, a perfectly consistent narrative. And Matthew comes along and takes over a bunch of stuff from Mark, right? Copies this over, preserves it verbatim in the Gospel. But in one place, makes a change that is characteristic of Matthew. That it is the kind that it that is, it's the kind of change that Matthew can be seen to make elsewhere to his sources. And in doing this, Matthew accidentally creates a narrative inconsistency. Because he's elsewhere copied over something from Mark that doesn't fit with that characteristic change. My favorite example of this comes from Joel Marcus also of Duke University. And Joel, uh, in a article, showed that there is evidence of editorial fatigue in Jesus' stilling of the storm. So in Mark, a great windstorm happens and waves beat the boat, right? And then a little bit later into the story, in Mark, Jesus rebukes the wind and calms the sea. Perfectly consistent story. Makes total sense. Windstorms cause waves, cause wind. No problems. We go over to Matthew, and Matthew copies over the story exactly, right? I've got this lined up pretty as closely as I could. Um, we see Matthew copying over the story with only the smallest changes. But Matthew makes one very important change at the beginning. He substitutes out Mark's windstorm for an earthquake. And this, Joel has shown, is the sort of thing that Matthew does, Matthew likes. Matthew likes earthquakes, to quote the beginning line of his article. Um, in three different places in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew adds in earthquakes to stories he's copying out of Mark. Uh, one really famous one that we've talked about uh, on the New Testament Review podcast is uh, the Matthean zombies, right? Um, the At the end of Matthew, there's an earthquake added in, uh, and the holy ones rise from the graves and walk around Jerusalem. Um, here we have uh, this, this exact same thing happening again. Oh, and I should say, it's, this is probably because uh, first century Jews, it seemed, um, Joel Marcus provides good evidence for this, first century Jews believed that earthquakes would accompany the day of the Lord, the return of Yahweh to Zion, um, the... Uh, the eschatological expectation of the Jews included um, earthquakes. So here we see Matthew adding in earthquakes to Mark. But the problem is he copies over Jesus' speech. And the Synoptic Gospels do this a lot. The Synoptic Gospels are, are more conservative with the words of Jesus than they are with narrative details. And here Jesus rebukes the winds. The problem is earthquakes don't generate wind. Matthew has created a narrative inconsistency. He's created an earthquake that generates winds. They generate waves, yes, as, in, as we can see in the, in the very verse. But later into the story, they seem to have also generated winds. Well, this is easily explained um, by Matthew simply slipping back in to copying over the verbatim wording of his source. The best explanation for Matthew's breezy earthquake, I would argue, is editorial fatigue. That is, Matthew has made a change and then lapsed back into the wording of his source, thereby creating a narrative inconsistency. There are other good cases of this. Uh, this one in the Feeding of the 5,000 is from Mark Goodacre's article, and this is Luke becoming fatigued with his editing of Mark. Mark tells the story, the feeding of the 5,000, in a desert, in a deserted place by themselves. And this is retained three verses later when the disciples come to Jesus and say, this is a deserted place. Send the people away so that they can get something in the surrounding country and villages. 
makes perfect sense in Mark. But we come to Luke, and Luke, as he so often does, moves this story geographically. He has relocated it to the city of Bethsaida. And Bethsaida, it will be a problem, is a fishing village. It's a major fishing village. So lots of people live here. Uh, but when we move a couple of verses later, and we get the same, the same statement from the disciples. They say, send them away to the surrounding villages and countryside, for we are here in a deserted place. We see the copying here of Mark. Luke has copied out of Mark something that no longer makes sense in his narrative. He relocates them to Bethsaida, but then keeps this statement that we are here in a deserted place, and the disciples apparently think to get food, they need to go to surrounding villages. There is one more good case I want to talk about, uh, and this is in the Gospel of Matthew, um, again using Mark. So here in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the relationship of Herod and John is a bit complicated. Herod, it says at the end of this bit, yet he liked to listen to him, and Herod protected him. Herod likes, the go uh, likes John the Baptist in the Gospel of Mark. It's Herodias, Herod's wife in the Gospel of Mark, who doesn't like John the Baptist, and has to trick him with the dancing girl, um, has to trick Herod into killing Mark, or into killing John the Baptist. And this makes Herod sad, right? The king was deeply grieved. When he gets tricked, um, because he likes John, he gets sad. We go over to Matthew, however, and from the very beginning of the story, Herod wants to kill John. There is n the sentiment that Herod likes John or protected him completely disappears. Not attested at all in Matthew. From the beginning of the story, Herod doesn't like John. But we get to the end of that story, and we find that Matthew has copied over this description of Herod's grief. Why is Herod sad in Matthew? He's getting what he wants. He wants to kill John, and now he's got an excuse. Well, I think this makes the best sense if we understand this as editorial fatigue. Matthew has made a change, and it's in fact the kind of change that is uniquely Matthewan. That is, a tension between Jesus, or between good people, John the Baptist and Jesus, and rulers, um, and powerful people. Um, it is in Matthew in particular that we see, for instance, the conflict of the, with the Pharisees, which is not at all a theme in Luke, and a very minor theme in Mark. Um, conflict with rulers is an emphasis of Matthew's. And we see here a antagonism towards John from the very beginning, um, but then a copying over of Mark's grief, Mark's description of Herod's grief. So, this is a set of arguments, uh, the arguments from editorial fatigue, and if you look, you can't find any reverse cases. There are no good cases of Mark becoming fatigued with Matthew and Luke. That would look like Mark making a characteristic Mark and change, then lapsing back into the wording of Matthew and Luke, creating, creating an inconsistency. Such things don't exist. So, we have editorial fatigue as argument number one. A second argument is the implausibility of the redaction profile of Mark. Redaction profile is the word is the name for um, redaction is when you an author makes changes to a source. You can look at the changes they you they make in using a source and see the kinds of things they're interested in. You can see the kinds of changes they make and what that reveals about the author's interests or purposes. Um, a reduction profile is if you collect all of these changes and pay attention to the tendencies or themes that run through the kinds of changes this person makes. So, um, for instance, if on the premise of Mark and Priority, we can see Matthew has a redaction profile, um, reveals an interest in the law, um, but that's assuming our conclusion. So let's go back and talk about this as an argument for Mark and Priority. My claim is 
and this is another cl other people have made this argument. Uh, Mark Goodacre makes this in the two, in the book to um, the case against Q, uh, is that Mark is an impl um, the redaction profile of Mark is highly implausible if we understand him using Matthew. The kind of changes he would have had to make to Matthew are not the kinds of changes we can expect from a person who has decided to write the Gospel of Mark, from a person who has decided to write a Gospel about Jesus. So let's look at a couple examples. In Mark and Matthew, in Mark we get Jesus could no do no deed of power there. We get Mark depicts Jesus as unable to heal some people. In the exact same story in Matthew, we find Jesus did not do many deeds of power. So, um, so here we get uh, a perfectly plausible, I think, um, motive for Matthew changing Mark. That is, Matthew has made Jesus a little more capable. It ki might be kind of weird for a Christian to think that Jesus can't heal. But if we look at what kind of person Mark would have to be, what kind of Christian Mark would have to be, he has to come across a story um, that has Jesus choosing not to heal and says, no, what we really need, this story is perfect. I'm going to copy over the story verbatim. Great story. But what we really need is Jesus unable to heal. We need Jesus' inability to heal. Um, and I think someone who is interested in downplaying Jesus' abilities is not a very plausible way to understand the author of a gospel. Inversely, I think it's totally possible, we'll talk about this in a second, totally plausible that Matthew is upgrading Mark that Mark has textualized this for the first time, has written this story up about Jesus for the first time, and Matthew has been a little bit uncomfortable with just how limited Jesus is in a number of places, according to Mark. A similar thing, although not uh, miracle working in this case, um, there are other cases of miracle working where similar things happen, where Jesus takes two attempts to heal a blind man, where Matthew just makes him able to do it with the power of a word. Um, also, Matthew and Luke both seem to dislike Jesus using mud and spit to heal, which is the sort of thing magicians did in antiquity. And so Mark has him using those elements, whereas Matthew and Luke both have him just doing it with the power of speech. But here in Mark, we get, um, this is the rich young ruler, Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. It is a plausible way to read this as Jesus denying that he is God. And it is a very plausible way to read this as Jesus denying that he is good. Why do you call me good? There's at least, of course, I don't think Jesus was actually denying that he was good. Um, but it is this, it raises the question of Jesus' own goodness and seems to kind of deny this sort of thing. And we can imagine a Christian being uncomfortable with this. And indeed, when we look to Matthew, we see, why do you ask me about what is good? We have Jesus instead asking a philosophical question. Why do you ask me about the nature of goodness, he says. Again, I'm concerned about the redaction profile of Mark. If we believed Mark is using Matthew, we get someone here who gets the story of Jesus asking about the nature of goodness and says no, we should have Jesus questioning his own goodness, throwing, calling his own goodness into question. And I would suggest that in both these places, um, you get a Mark who seems to be interested in lowering, in making Matthew's portrayal of Jesus less powerful and less good. Um, and that doesn't seem to be the sort of thing that someone who writes a gospel would do. The case, I think, gets even stronger when you look at big omissions. So Matthew and Luke both record a story of Jesus' conception and virgin birth, right? Um, Jesus, there's an angelophany uh, and the Holy Spirit overshadows um, Jesus and Luke, and we get um, the story of Jesus' miraculous birth. Uh, likewise, Matthew and Luke both get uh, tell stories of the appearances of Jesus at the resurrection, um, stories of Jesus appearing to the disciples. Um, and then we'll talk about the Lord's Prayer, but they also also have, both have the Lord's Prayer. And Mark has none of these. What kind of person comes across a gospel in which Jesus is born of a virgin and says, we need to get rid of that. That's bad. Similarly, 
who comes to a story, a gospel, and says and sees Jesus appearing to people miraculously? Uh, or, or, sorry, sees descriptions of Jesus' resurrection appearances and says, those aren't important. We need to leave those off. What kind of person is Mark if he come, he gets Matthew and Luke and decides to erase resurrection appearances and the virgin birth? Again, I think we get the kind of Christian who, um, well, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't fit the things that we know Mark believed. Because Mark believed that Jesus had resurrection appearances. He references them in Mark 13. Um, that he will, that, um, and then uh, the angel in Mark 16 says he will appear to you in Galilee. He doesn't deny these things. Um, but we get a picture of Mark as someone who wants to delete these if he's using Matthew and Luke. And the Lord's Prayer is another argument I've pulled from Mark Goodacre. Both Matthew and Luke have versions of the Lord's Prayer, and almost every element of the Lord's Prayer, you can find corresponding things in Mark's depiction of Jesus. And yet, Mark deletes it, if he's using Matthew and Luke. The inverse, of course, is totally plausible. We'll talk about it in a second. That Matthew and Luke have come across a story of Jesus lacking a resurrection, virgin birth, and the Lord's Prayer, and have added these things in. Um, so, the Mark. This, these are the two best arguments I believe for Mark in priority. Um, sometimes there are other things, particularly Mark's upgrades, Mark's corrections of Matthew and Luke. Um, sorry, Matthew and Luke's corrections of Mark. Uh, Matthew and Luke's upgrades to Mark that are uh, that are adduced as arguments for Mark in priority. And I don't think these are good arguments. Um. I think it's best to understand these things as insights we get into the character of Matthew and Luke if we assume Mark in priority. And I think part of the reason I would say that we shouldn't look at Mark's correction of, or Matthew's correction of geographical details um, or correction of biblical citations, we shouldn't see these as arguments for Mark in priority, is because there are lots of second century gospels third century gospels, and on, that introduce errors into the retellings of Jesus that are dependent on the synoptics and produce new problems. There's no rule that that authors will improve upon their sources. And so I don't think these things work as arguments for Mark and priority. But what kind of, but they do tell us something about what kind of author Matthew and Luke are on the assumption that they have Mark. The most obvious, of course, is they add in virgin birth, resurrection, and Lord's Prayer. Um, and I think we can see here, I mean, we have independent corroboration that many Christians thought Mark, without a resurrection appearance, was a deficient. Um, the manuscripts of Mark's gospel have three different endings to the gospel of Mark appended to them. People have taken other gospel traditions, probably using Luke and other synoptics, um, and written endings for Mark and appended these to the Gospel of Mark. Um, Christians don't like, once Christians are familiar with Matthew and Luke, Christians don't like Mark's uh, conclusion. That doesn't mean the composition of Mark is necessarily implausible. I think it's perfectly plausible that Mark would want to keep the sort of, uh, the actual manifestations of Jesus off screen, so to speak. Um, that he clearly signals that they happen, but doesn't want to nar- doesn't narrate that chooses not to narrate them, or begins Jesus' life not at his birth but at his baptism. These seem to me perfectly plausible authorial choices. What doesn't seem plausible to me is cutting out a virgin birth or resurrection once you already have it. Um, and we do see the kind of person, the kind of author interests that Matthew and Luke have by seeing how they add these things into Mark. Similarly, we have these stories, right? We have. Uh, Matthew upgrading Mark's Christology. We have Matthew coming along and being a little bit uncomfortable with Jesus' inability to heal, and instead say, says, this should be Jesus' choice. And one of these uh, examples of um, an upgrade or correction um, is the... I'm just going to shrink myself here real quick. Um, uh, there we go. Uh, is... The Tyre and Sidon story. Um, So this has sometimes been adduced as an argument for Mark and priority, but I think it's better viewed as the sort of thing we can learn about um, the authors of the Gospels by uh, 
maintaining Mark in priority. So in Mark, Jesus travels from Tyre through Sidon, down the Sea of Galilee, and into the Decapolis. The problem with this is, let's see, you get my mouse here. Uh, the problem with this is Tyre is south of Sidon, and the Decapolis is south of both. This would be like someone saying that Ian traveled down the coast of the ocean, down the Atlantic coast, from Durham, through New York City, and into Georgia. That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, Tyre and Sidon, the author of Mark, has got flipped. These are associated, often associated cities, and he's got the orientation of them wrong. But Matthew comes along, sees the mistake, and fixes it. He passes from, he's still in Tyre, he passes along the Sea of Galilee, he delete, we see the deletion of the reference to Sidon, um, and he ends up, well, on a mountain for the beginning of Matthew uh, 15. Um, we also, this is another famous case where there seems to be a little bit of a problem in Mark that Matthew and Luke fix. So in Mark 2, uh, this is the controversy over working on the Sabbath. Mark says that this happened. Uh, Mark has Jesus refer to David eating the showbread in the temple during the priesthood of Abiathar. The problem with this, of course, is that if you go read the story, as it's reported in 1 Samuel, you will discover that the story Jesus is referring to, um, at that time, Abiathar is not high priest. Ahimelech is someone else whose name starts with an A. Mark seems to have gotten his high priests confused. Well, Matthew fixes the mistake. He deletes the reference to the high priesthood. We see here again, this is not an argument for Mark in priority, so much as it is we get um, a picture of the kind of person Matthew is, in this case, a sensitive reading reader of scripture. Um, uh, we get we get an insight into who Matthew is by understanding the ways the author changes, upgrades Mark's gospel. So in sum, we have a literary relationship between the synoptic gospels. Uh, there is good reasons to question whether or not the traditional authorships um, supplied by gospel titles and uh, Papias are reliable we see that there is that editorial fatigue that Mark, uh, that Matthew and Luke make changes to Mark, characteristic changes to Mark, and then by copying verbatim out of Mark, lapse back, lapsing back into Mark's Mark's wording, create narrative inconsistencies, and finally we see that the image we get of Mark as someone working with Matthew and Luke is not the kind of author. Um, whom we can imagine, who we can imagine sitting down to write a gospel of Mark. <laughs> um, it is an implausible portrait of someone who wants to get rid of resurrection and make Jesus weaker and make Jesus question his own goodness. We get a very strange Christian indeed if Mark um, is using Matthew and Luke. So, these have persuaded virtually all scholars who are working on the synoptic problem, who study the synoptic gospels, that Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke are coming along and using Mark's gospel to compose their own. And this position is called Markan priority. <laughs>